Well, thank you, Paula, for that great presentation. So I'm Angela Sandana. I am a Siletz tribal member who earned a bachelor's degree in wildlife science from Oregon State University. And I followed that with a PhD in botany from the University of Idaho. And I've been working for the last 20 some years for the Nez Perce tribe. And today, the title of my talk is, Can You See the Forest for the Fuels? And I titled it this way because I wanna highlight our current dysfunctional relationship with fire in our forested landscapes. An alternate title could have been Fire Ecology and the Climate Crisis, because fire ecology and the natural role of fire as an ecosystem process have become a victim of the climate crisis. And I'll try to explain some of that as we go along. But before we get there, I do want to just give you some context as to why I'm talking about this topic and how I got here today. So I am a project leader with the tribe, and my main project is the Heta Wet'suwet'es project or the Precious Lands Project that's located in the Lower Joseph Creek Watershed. This is a joint project between the Nez Perce Tribe who owns and manages the land and the Bonneville Power Administration who funds the work as part of their obligation under, under the Northwest Power Act and is to mitigate for the wildlife losses associated with the lower four Snake River dams. So our project is seen here on the slide in the very middle in pink. Directly to the south of us is the Willow Whitman National Forest off to the northwest is the Umatilla National Forest. And then across the river, the Snake River into Idaho, we have the Craig Mountain Wildlife Area. And so we're right in the middle of this wonderful corridor for wildlife and um, rewilding opportunities in this lower Joseph Creek watershed. But perhaps, um, so our project goals are your standard goals, protect, improve, diversify, provide reasonable public access. But this project protects over 17,000 acres of land, mostly canyon grassland, but we also have beautiful forest stringers and over 16 miles of perennial stream that have listed steelhead. But perhaps our most salient uh, feature of this project is where it's located in the watershed. It's in the lower end of Joseph Creek. And so the landowner in the upper reaches of the watershed is the national forest. Lao Whitman National Forest. And so whatever they do on their landscape directly affects the wildlife area and the tribe's land below. So you can see on this map, there is a pink line, a very large line, and that represents the lower Joseph Creek analysis area. And as part of this analysis, the Forest Service came up with the Lower Joseph Creek Restoration Project. They signed the record of decision in 2017, and under that decision, they per proposing or planning to log over 17,000 acres of the upper watershed in Joseph Creek. That represents 30% of the forested landscape under their ownership. And they're gonna offer this, this in five timber sales over a 10 year span. As part of that logging operation, they were going to reconstruct 82 miles of road, construct 12 miles of temporary road, and reopen 23 miles of roads that were previously closed to support this activity. And you can see the sale units here on the left of the screen in green and pink. They also, though, approved and authorized up to 90,000 acres of prescribed burning. And the tribe is like, wow, this is really a good opportunity. These are fire adapted landscapes that haven't seen fire on a large scale since the late 1980s. They really do need to have fire reintroduced to reintroduce that ecological process. So we did get behind that part of the project. But in the implementation phase, they've already finished or finishing up one sale. They've sold the second sale. Um, they did remove two culverts, and, and maybe that makes up for that 117 miles of road reconstruction. I don't know. <laughs> but to date, they've achieved zero acres of the prescribed burning. And when we questioned them about that, we were told, oh, we're not going to do any of the burning until the timber sales are done. Like, silly. We're doing the timber sales first. And this is a pattern that we see repeatedly. And then when it does come time to prescribe burn, they have a really hard time meeting those targets. So meanwhile, on the Precious Lands Project, we are so remote, it's so rugged, there's so few roads, it basically functions as a quasi-wilderness area. And we are not allowed to have commercial activities like logging or commercial livestock grazing. And so we use a lot of passive restoration techniques as part of our management. 
And to monitor the effects of that, we have established 30 permanent vegetation plots that we repeat sample at four to five year intervals. And today I wanna share data from two of our conifer plots because I feel they're representative of many of the forested ecosystems and, and stands that we see in Eastern Oregon. So one is up in the upper left corner on the Buford unit, and the other is in the Broddy Creek drainage. So the first plot you can see here, you can see our transect running through the middle of it. Northerly aspects, all of our forests are northerly aspects. It is a mixed conifer stand that's dominated by ponderosa pine, but has dug fir in it. There is a history of logging. The folks that owned this property before the tribe got it did log this unit, did a quite a nice job but they did intensively graze it with their livestock. So those are two things that, that are salient to what we saw with our monitoring. There's no recent fire activity, but there is historic fire scars. And we've sampled this site five times over the last 19 years. So what we saw was in the shrub component, shrub canopy cover increased a whopping 19%. So that currently 84% canopy coverage of shrubs in this forested stand and all size classes of shrubs increased over time. The trees did really well as, along that time too. Average tree DBH increased 2.75 inches so that the average tree DBH is 19.8. And canopy cover is around 51%. So really the tree canopies, we're pretty happy with that. We also saw though that all age size classes of trees either declined or stayed pretty static over the same time frame that the shrubs were growing uh, exponentially. On the other plot, similarly, it's a north aspect, much steeper, a little higher elevation, dominated by Doug fir, but does have ponderosa pine. History of light livestock grazing. grazing. This is so steep, even the cows don't want to go there. No recent fire activity, but historic fire scars. The shrubs increased on this site as well, but at a lower rate only 4.9% for a final uh, estimate of 75% shrub canopy cover. So shrubs are still increasing, but at a lower rate from the managed stand. Average tree D DBH uh, decreased by 1.77 inches to a total of about 13.5 on average. So smaller trees declining DBH. We attribute this to a very severe event disturbance event that occurred between 2014 and 2019. We're not sure what it was, probably weather related, a severe windstorm or heavy snows followed by winds. So it did really trash the stand. But when we look at these two sites in conjunction, we see that the shrub canopy cover over 19 years increased significantly to an average of 80%. Shrubs in the managed stand increased at a higher rate, faster rate, and grew taller than those in the unmanaged stand. And as a result, at least at the Buford site, we were seeing some stress in the trees. But the number of trees per acre decreased or remained fairly stable across all size classes. The canopy trees remained fairly stable within a couple percentages for canopy cover. So if the shrub component is developing faster and providing increased fuel loads compared to the tree component, why do managers continue to promote logging as a solution to improve fire resiliency in these dry side forests. We consulted with a specialist from the NRCS and we were told, we're not in the business of cutting brush. They wanted to cut the trees. And we're like, but the trees are in great shape. They're beautiful, we wanna keep the trees. Well, we're not in the business of cutting brush. And in his defense, he comes by this attitude um, after years and years of being force fed a narrative. And there has been an evolution of a narrative around logging and fire in the forest. So back in the day, the Forest Service used to call a spade a spade, and they'd say, this is a timber sale. That's what it is. We're going to be upfront about it. Well, that didn't play very well with the public. So then they started saying, well, oh, it's a stand improvement project. We're really smart, and we're going to make things better. And then they're like, well, fire's an issue. Let's call it a fuels reduction project, you know? But then all three of these are sort of forestry focused and that became unpopular. And so pretty quickly they're like, well, let's just call it a vegetation management project. <laughs> it's sufficiently vague. They won't know what we're doing, but it'll sound better. And then someone got creative and said, oh, we'll call it integrated vegetation management. And 
so it goes. And then they finally started to admit, hey, we've been doing a kind of a poor job with these forests. We need to have restoration projects. Who can't get behind a good restoration project? And then now, in the era of the climate crisis, we're calling them forest resiliency projects. It's the new buzzword. And someone on the Umatilla got really creative and said, we're going to do a forest and riparian resiliency project. So they just keep upping the game in this narrative to convince the public, and sometimes themselves, that what they're doing with commercial logging is the best tool to address and manage our forests. And they use very good keywords like prescription and treatment and improvement to make us all feel better about what they're actually doing. My favorite, though, was called the End of the World Project. And this one came out of the Nez Perce Clearwater National Forest in Idaho. And it was truly an awful project. So I want to thank Friends of the Clearwater for successfully litigating this project and getting it remanded to the forest. And it was not on their statement of proposed actions last time we worked with them. So this narrative has told them that words matter. And this sort of approach to fear-based um, narrative has made it to the highest level of our government. On Earth Day, President Biden signed an executive, direct, direct, executive order to strengthen America's forests, increase wildfire resiliency, and combat global deforestation. And the press release shown here on the screen came out, and this is probably as close as anyone in the public is going to get to this actual executive order, is the press relief, release. And in that, wildfire was mentioned 16 times. And it was always in the context of wildfire threats, wildfire risks, wildfire risk reduction, wildfire resiliency. Nowhere did you see the words fire ecology, prescribed burning, controlled burning, or ecological processes. And so this fear-based uh, narrative is being used to convince the public that they have a choice. Megafires or logging. If we log it, it won't burn as bad. Or we need to log it before it burns. And this is a false equivalency that's really disingenuous by our federal land managers. Because no matter what we do, we're going to have climate fires. That is our reality. Just like we're losing our ice sheets and we're losing our coral reefs, we have mucked things up so bad, we're going to have climate fires. But I think we need to also embrace the role of fire as a natural ecological process. We have to have fire as a tool to combat the large megafires that we're facing. And I believe that prescribed burning is going to be one of the key tools that we're going to have to protect our old growth forests and our old legacy trees. But it's going to take a very um, pretty significant paradigm shift a shift that in some times, some instances, is going to include more liberal let burn policies. This is a fire that started in Joseph Canyon. I argued very strongly, we should let this burn. It was early season, and this area hadn't burned since the late 80s, and I was told absolutely no, don't even discuss it, it's not going to happen. So having this paradigm shift is a lot to ask. So I'd like to pose the question. Can traditional lifeways provide an answer? Traditional peoples have evolved in place with an intimate knowledge of their environment and the environmental processes that they need to sustain themselves and the resources that they're dependent on. And that includes fire ecology. Indigenous peoples were the first fire managers. And most indigenous cultures are based on key principles of respect, reciprocity, renewal, resiliency, and relationship with the natural world that is often lacking in the Western uh, frame of mind. So these concepts um, can be brought forward. And there's a growing recognition that tribal people, indigenous people around the globe can be a part of the solution for some of these climate impacts. And my favorite quote is the one at the bottom there from Frank Lake. And he is a research scientist with the Forest Service. And he says, considering tribal cultures and their attitudes and use of fire to manage land is essential 
to how we manage fire sheds today and it will be important to our work into the future. And so I think that's a really important concept. And tribes are recognizing the vast impacts that climate change is having on their life sources and their use of the seasonal round. They understand that having only by having healthy forests, healthy grasslands, healthy wildlife and fish populations, can they themselves have a healthy culture. And so it's this paradigm that they would bring to the table as a solution-based um, approach to our climate crisis and fire ecology. Fortunately, there are strong tribal governments all over this country, and specifically in this region, that are willing and able to help engage and promote this shift of a paradigm to a more healthy, inclusive, realistic sort of paradigm and worldview to our natural environment. What we really need in this paradigm shift is one to a more holistic stewardship vision. We want a region where stewardship priorities powerfully shape land management that is responsive, holistic, and just. Where management decisions support the intrinsic, spiritual, cultural, and ecological values of our forests. Where extractive activities are not the only tool in the toolbox. And I would argue that we can and must do better. And I really appreciate your time this afternoon, and thank you for listening to me.